What's up, guys? This is Mind Pump. All right, today's episode, we have a good giveaway. It's actually an exciting giveaway for me. My book is out. You'll get a copy of this sent to your door. Hard cover. Look at that. Isn't that great? There's a picture of me in there. It's kind of weird. But anyway, we'll give you a copy of this book if you do the following. Subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, and leave a comment in the first 24 hours. And then if we pick your comment, you'll get a free copy of The Resistance Training Revolution written by yours truly. I know you're going to love this episode. Real quick before it gets started, we are running a sale this month, a big sale. MAPS Anabolic is 50% off and the Shredded Summer Bundle is 50% off. So both of them half off. Go learn about them or sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just remember to use the code April Special for that 50% off discount. All right, enjoy this podcast. I have something for the YouTubers. Wow. Remember when Sal used to call them YouTubers? Hey, don't put it on me. You yeah. just did some old ass I just shit. Blocked right you right there. No, that was exactly that was your thing. Was don't you remember that? Yeah, I might have done it a long this time. This is ago. for the YouTubers yeah. out there. Hey, YouTubers. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> no, we have something that I think uh, is obviously gonna uh, ruffle some feathers when we say it like this, but um meal plans may be making you fat. You know what's funny? Say what? This is one of those things that when you first become a trainer. You're, this is what you're sold on. Like mm -hmm. this is how you do it. This is how it works. Here's the formula. Go do it. And it's and then you reverse so hard. You make a 180 uh, with this later on in your career. And there's there's a few things like that as as personal trainers, but this one has to be one of the one of the strongest ones. Like if you told me in the first two or three years I was a trainer that meal plans not only were they ineffective. Mm -hmm. But they also caused people to gain weight. Um, I would have been like, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have, yeah, I would have said you're crazy. There's yeah. no way. I mean, that's what we were sold on. In fact, my first certifications, this was part of what they talked about. And when I managed gyms, this was the 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 nutrition side of what we did was exactly this. We would have people fill out a survey. And then we would give them meal plans. We'll also think about the hustle of that a little bit, you know, and how hard that they were trying to get us to push supplements and how the supplements were conveniently worked into the meal plan Always. as the meal replacement. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I, I saw the business end of that for sure, but I uh, wasn't really aware of, of how that was actually going to affect my clients, you know, not necessarily positively, but negatively as a result. So were you, were you around at 24 when they did, when Apex did the n meal plans? That, I was there when... When Apex first uh, became a part of uh, 24. So were you there afterwards? Were they like, so we used to have to do this thing where, you know, I think it was, God, it must have been at least three or four sheets of questionnaires yes. that they had to fill out. Yep. And then part of your job as a trainer was you, you implemented it in the computer, right? And this, They'd figure out if you had more carbs, less fat. Yeah. So more, the, right. and, the, and you put in all their measurements and then the software, do you remember these meal plans? They I were hilarious, oh my right? God. You would get like a, and the computer, okay, the way the software worked, it was definitely, this was, you you're know, just trying to fill the macros by the way. Well, as a trainer. yeah, but if you, if you remember, I wish I, and I, I bet if I go uh, in, you know, find in my uh, storage, I could probably find some of these old printouts because I printed out so many. The the computer just takes their you know their weight their activity level the all the foods that they said they like or didn't like or whatever you know because there was like four bubbles it was like you really don't like it you never will eat it or you, yeah, you yeah. kind of so whatever rarely never like so, sometimes, sometimes so never. it would it would kick off like a, a snack would be something like this uh, half an orange two saltine yeah, crackers yes. <laughs> two saltine yeah, crackers. yeah three tablespoons of peanut butter yeah. it was like yeah. this weird. You know, to make it work. I had half an English muffin. Yeah, you know, as one of them. Yeah. And, oh my god, and like a, a quarter of a chicken breast. Yeah. I, and I remember being a really young trainer, and just like this is, I mean, at that time, um, my my level of of education and nutrition was very very minimal, and so I leaned heavily on you know the Apex certification mm -hmm. and the and this computer's algorithm to tell my clients what to do, you know, and I, I'm just going to be a cheerleader and, and take you through your workout. Like I'm not a nutrition guy. Save the other half of the orange for tomorrow. Well, I, I clients would come <laughs> to me and they're like, Adam, what do we, do, do I really have to eat like this? Like, what am I going to do with a quarter can of tuna? Like, what, what am I going to do? With the, <laughs> yeah. Like, what do I do with the rest? And like, yeah. and I remember going like, two tablespoons of orange juice. And I remember having uh, responses like Sal just said, well, you know, save the rest for the next day. Yeah, it's yeah. just like, that is the dumbest now, thing. Ever. Now, all joking aside, of course, people these days make meal plans and they make them much more, I guess, realistic, right? But that still doesn't change the fact that they're super not effective. Now, the reason why this is such a uh, so attractive is because one of the number one things people say to trainers, or at least one of the number one things people would say to me when I when they'd hire me, would be, 
Just tell me what to do. I'm going to give you yes. money, Sal. And then, and of course, they're coming to me in this high state, uh, this this motivated state of mind, mm -hmm. right? They finally decided to hire a trainer, probably been thinking about it for months, and they just decided they're going to spend a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars. Give on you money. I literally just, I'm just going to show up. Yeah, just, like that was the mentality. If you just do, I'll do exactly what you tell me. And then that's it. That'll solve my problem, and I'll I'll get in shape. And of course, uh, it doesn't work that way. Now, uh, number one, if you haven't guessed by now, a meal plan. When well, we're talking about meal plans, what we're talking about are literally plans that tell you what to eat for yeah. breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, or whatever. Everything is very specific. Yes. It has all the calories, all the macro breakdown, and you have to literally follow it to a T. Now, I I do have. I have some empathy for the trainers that are that are new that are put in this position too, though, totally. because you know, to your point, Sal, about you know, clients come in and they say this, like, and they're paying, right? You're a new trainer, you're just starting to starting to build your your business, your portfolio of clients, and like, you know, you're on client twelve, you know, you're barely getting started here, and the client's like, I want a meal plan, you know, I pay you eighty dollars an hour, tell me what to eat, yeah, tell me what to eat, like. You have, and more than likely, you haven't been taught how to navigate through that conversation uh, the right way to get to the place where you want to get them to where you teach them yes. how to do this. It's like, also compounded, though, with the fact that you know, as a trainer, if they just ate what you told them, they would lose weight. Right. Now, this is yeah. the hard part about this, okay? The hard yeah. part is if you did eat the right amount of calories, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates through eating exactly what your meal plan tells you, you will lose weight. You will see results from that standpoint. Now, the problem is not what happens when you follow it perfectly. The problem is what happens when you stop following it. And what you, you're very likely to not follow it to begin with. And this mm -hmm. was just in, in our experience. It's extremely, it's extremely rigid uh, process, and it doesn't focus on working on people's the real reason why they have issues with. Well, them. it also echoed a lot of the frustration. A lot of trainers I would talk to, like my clients are just not following this, and they're not coming in. They're not. They're eating all the wrong foods, and the, not realizing that it was it was weird. Like they like I eat this way all the time. I can't understand why they won't do this. Right. Well, before we make the case on you know why they are making people fat. I, I, I do want to defend where I see value in them still today. So, I mean, Sal, you said it only took you a few years. It took me probably a decade uh, before I moved completely away from uh, meal plans. But I do want to talk about uh, the clientele or the type of person where I still see value here, right? right. And the, ver the first one that comes to mind, obviously, for me, is competitors. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. if, um, if you're going to, if you have 12 or 16 weeks to get down to, 3% body fat to get on a stage and present yourself, then it makes sense. If you're an athlete and you have a specific goal for a particular season, then it, it starts to make sense because you have a goal, you know where you want to get, and there's, and right. it's very specific. It's also, by the way, competitors and, and even athletes in this sense don't have a long-term approach because no. a competitor is just thinking about getting on stage. Now, if you're uh, listening, you're not a competitor and you say, well, I just want to get in shape. You got to think about the after. Mm -hmm. You have to think about the after. Who wants to get in shape only to go get back out of shape? And that's, again, that's the big problem. Well, and I think some people do have that mentality when they're hyper motivated and they think that I'm just going to get through this, lose the weight, do whatever I have to do, and then I'll go right back, you know, to the way I like to eat and and not realizing that that's completely different and, and they're going to have this crazy rebounding effect. So I, I learned to set my clients up once I figured out how to move them away from this, right? So the conversation I'd have, because this is, you hear this all time. Time. You know, I add them, they hire you and they go, I want to lose 30 pounds as fast as I possibly can. You know, what, what is it going to take? What is it? Give me the meal plan, whatever. And I say, okay, cool. And I just, I hear that and then go about our, our conversation. We move along. And then when I circle back to like laying out our plan and what we're going to be doing, I would always drop this like, so no, you, you want to lose 30 pounds as fast as we can, right? Now, do you want to put it all back on afterwards or do you want to actually keep it off for the rest of your life? And of course, what do they say to you? Yeah, nobody you know? wants to put it back on. Right. Nobody says, oh, yeah, I want to lose it and then put it all back on. They have this idea of, I just want to get there as fast as possible, and then I'll figure it out later. Right. Or I'll deal with it. But the truth is, it's going to come back on. And that's where I would then make the case, like, well, listen, if we go about it with the intent of just trying to do this as fast as we possibly can, 
it's like 90% chance you're going to put all that weight back on, if not more. In fact, in my experience, it's, it's 100, almost always 100%. Like more. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I say it never like 90. There's always exceptions to the rule. But every client I ever trained that just followed a meal plan and didn't learn anything along the process always puts it back in. So then you get them to commit to that part of it. But back to the competitor thing, that that is a very sport-specific goal. And that person doesn't care about. I'm not talking about 10 years later. I'm talking about the show I have in three months right, right. that I have to be in, in the most primo shape and I have to get there as fast as I possibly can. This is again where I see that I see that value there because we're, we're not talking about long. I mean, sports in general are not healthy for you for no, longevity. Well, well, you're literally putting your lifestyle on hold, you know, right. in order to get to that goal. And right. so it's all about discipline. And so this fits right in with that like ultimate discipline. Right. So short term goals, this kind of makes sense, right? All right. I have this short term goal of uh, maybe figuring out why I have gout. Sometimes foods can be attached to that. So I need to reduce this, see what happens. Or you have a surgery coming up. That's another short term goal. Believe it or not, I, I know situations where people have had to lose weight to get particular surgeries. Okay. There's, there's that one as well. Food intolerance is another one. Like, okay, I can't figure out why I have all these gut issues. I've tried all these different ways of, of solving it. Can't figure it out. I'm going to do 12-week elimination diet. I'm going to put together a meal plan so I know exactly what's going on in my mouth, mm -hmm. and I can really start to pinpoint what's my problem. But again, that's very, very short term. Mm -hmm. There is no long-term uh, meal plan that's successful unless you're uh, orthorexic, unless you're you have dysfunction where you literally have – the exact same thing that you eat every single day where, all right, breakfast is a quarter cup of oatmeal and a half a cup of milk and a tablespoon of peanut butter. Like, this is exactly how I live. And obviously, this is not a very healthy way to be as well. Well, and to your point about short term, I know there's a bunch of people that are listening right now and they're like, oh, it's shaking their head. I disagree. Mm -hmm. When I followed X meal plan, I was in the best shape of my life. And so then I would challenge you, well, where the fuck are you at right now, <laughs> right? It wasn't a long-term solution. In that short window, when you were following something to a T, right. you got in good shape, but then you fell out of shape again. And that's what we see here because, again, it's focusing on the short term. It isn't a long-term solution for most of the population. Right. Now, the main reason why it's not a long-term solution is because it does zero to focus on a person's behaviors. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, the reason why, and I'm going to challenge people right now, okay? Because I remember this was confusing for me early on as a trainer. I used to actually have this conversation with people where someone would hire me and they're 60 pounds overweight, or someone would hire me and they, they can barely sit in a chair without hurting or whatever. And I remember thinking to myself, like, that didn't happen overnight. The person who needs to lose 60 pounds at one point was 20 pounds overweight. At another point was 30 pounds overweight. At another point was 40 and 50 pounds overweight. What, were they not aware of what was happening during this whole period of time? And the truth is, you kind of are. You kind of are aware of what's going on. You just don't, you don't care. And now why is this important? Why is this important to know? Because the information's out there. It's not a problem that's solved with information. It isn't anymore. It's not a problem that's like, oh, I know why you're obese. You just... You just don't, you need to eat less calories. Right. Everybody knows to eat less calories. Yeah. Or, oh, you know why you're obese? You just don't know that you need to eat less and that you need to exercise. Everybody knows those things. Now, their approaches may be wrong, but the main reason why they're wrong is it's not focusing on the behaviors. Why do I overeat? Why do I have this relationship with food? Why do I have this relationship with movement that is that makes me not want to move? If you don't address those, no uh, no approach in the world is going to work. Well, you don't learn anything. Mm -hmm. You're giving them, as a trainer, as a coach, you're giving them the answers to the test. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's Imagine if that's how you went to school. No, really, yeah, though. You're Justin. I you, mean, oh, cool. you, you got an A. <laughs> they, 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 the client comes to you. They hire you to lose 30 pounds. Your job as a coach and a trainer is to teach them how to lose 30 pounds, not to just lose their 30 pounds. Otherwise, that's exactly what you're doing. You're just giving them the answers to the test. Then when they're done, they have no clue on really what got them there other than, oh, if I hire a coach and follow a meal plan, that's the answer. And that is not an answer for long-term solution for anybody. No, and even if you're, let's say you're this billionaire and you have a trainer all the time and you have a chef that cooks you food all the time. So mm -hmm. everything is totally planned for you. Right. And that sounds great. Some people listening right now might be like, I would be in shape. Ooh, what a relief. That yeah, would totally get me in shape. No, it wouldn't because you still have to eat the food. You still have to not eat certain foods. You still have to do the workouts. So although people are telling you what to do, mm -hmm. you still have to participate. And this is why we still see overweight 
rich people. In fact, <laughs> here's the funny thing. People that tend to hire personal trainers tend to be wealthier. Personal training is relatively expensive. And yet, these are the people that are running into these problems. Yeah. So they have the resources to do this kind of stuff. It's still not working. And that's because the answer to this problem is not the give me the meal plan answer, but rather Whoa. we got to figure out a way to teach you, we got to lead you in a way to get you to a point where these are the decisions you make they on your own. They never really own the experience. You know, it's it's sort of like this insurance. Like I, I bought this and so, you know, it's something that they can always lean back on. Like, well, I have a trainer to kind of take care of this. And so when they're out in a situation where they have to navigate uh, certain types of foods, like, you know, certain types of behaviors where they're not moving quite as much, well, I'll just kind of bring all this right. back and they'll, they'll take care well, okay, so we've seen now the so many diet uh, since the time that all of us have been in the fitness space, right? So you're talking about two decades. I mean, I've seen so many diets hit the market. I've seen the Atkins diet hit the market. I've seen the paleo diet. I've seen Mediterranean diet. I've seen low fat diet. That was one of the first ones, right? Just mm -hmm. eating low fat. I've seen, you know, vegan diet. I've seen all these diets that have come out and been promoted as the best and next greatest thing. And if you just follow it, here's the numbers. Obviously, if you just eat, you know, like you're supposed to with the paleo or whatever, you're going to see good health numbers and it's going to work and all that stuff. But none of them made a dent, not even a dent in the, in the obesity epidemic. None of them made a dent in getting people really in long-term ways. And one of the main reasons, besides what we said earlier, which was the behaviors aren't addressed, one of the main reasons is because, besides that, is because they're all restrictive, right? Mm -hmm. So they all tell you, don't eat this segment of food, don't eat carbs, don't eat fat, don't eat foods that are brown or white or that are gluten or whatever. They're very restrictive. Now, here's the funny thing. And everybody agrees, by the way. Everybody yeah. watching, listening will be like, oh, yeah, he's right. Restrictive. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. What's more restrictive than a meal plan? Not only am I telling you you can't eat carbs, but I'm telling you this is only, all you're going to eat. Only this yeah. food for this <laughs> specific meal. Yes. You know what's funny about that? You talk about restrictive diets. Like, so let, let's just talk about keto and let's talk about how like limited you are in terms of like what your <laughs> options are. And, and so this brings in other companies to try and market. Now there's like keto fudge. You know, yeah. there, there's keto brownies. Yeah. Like, there's all these like manufactured ways of like trying to give you something that resembles like what you used to eat, but now it's like that. What do you think they're going to grab the most of versus like, you know, what they should be? Eating? Well, the other thing you have to understand is human behavior. We are rebellious by nature. Like yeah. that's just in our nature to be. We need to feel free. Yes. We yes. need to feel free. And, and you have to know this about yourself. And you're and by doing that, even though you're choosing to follow this meal plan, you're putting yourself in this restriction. And then you have that mental game of, oh, I can't have that. We just did an episode not that long ago about changing the way you you speak about your relationship with food and like it's not i can't have i don't want it right. or no thank you right? right it doesn't but if you keep saying that you can't oh i can't it's not on my meal plan like you are just setting yourself up for an explosion right. later on and you were talking about uh companies meeting demand mm -hmm. um by the way m m meal plans have been around forever in fact it's probably one of the first ways people dieted and it's some of the largest and longest running uh, you know, uh, marketers or, or you know, uh, companies in this space are based around this. Like Weight Watchers used right. to make all their money with frozen meals. Mm -hmm. So that, so there's your meal plan. Just eat our frozen meals. Jenny Craig was another one. Now they have Lean Cuisine or whatever. Hey, here's our diet and make it even easier for you. You don't even need to cook. In fact, just buy our meals, yeah. put it in the microwave or warm it up. On the, and you have everything perfect. And those, again, shake it, they fail. And you go it. Yeah. And those <laughs> also fail on a long-term basis. Number, the, and again, it's, it's literally nothing like real life. Let's talk about real life for a second. You live in a, in a modern society. You have an almost infinite uh, number of things you can eat any given moment. Like, the variety is incredible. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you don't just eat for taste- uh, or, or just to, for sustenance, you eat for lots of different reasons. There's social reasons. There's emotional reasons. Of course, there's taste and enjoyment uh, mm -hmm. reasons. So you have to navigate all of this in the real world, and a meal plan does nothing to teach you that. A meal plan literally just says, stay on this road. Oh, and by the way, real life involves all these other twists and turns, but you're just going to stay on this particular... That's almost impossible. And I remember when I would try following meal plans, 
what a pain in the ass that would be when you'd be out with a friend or yeah. not even going you'd out. You'd rather just stay home. Yeah, or even just with your family. Hey, honey, let's go to the beach today. And you're like, oh, fuck, I got my meal plan. What am I going to do and whatever. And I can see competitors do it for 12 weeks, but I can't see anybody doing it forever. Can you explain to Sal first, like, you know, Justin mentioned like the keto diet, for example. And I, I've seen this happen. Like, why is it when someone follows like the ketogenic diet for an extended period of time and then they come off and they like rapidly put on weight when they start consuming carbohydrates again? Right. Yeah. Well, one of the main reasons is because it creates this uh, psychological phenomenon where uh, if I stay in this parameter, I'm good. Anything outside of it is a fail, right? So it's not like if I have one thing off my meal plan, then I'm still okay. It's not on my meal plan at all. So now that I've gone off, once you've gone off, you're done. You're off. I already, you know. And how many times have you said, "I already, you know what? I already ate bad today." So let, what's what's yeah. let's have dinner too. Let's let's do dessert too. And it's a, it's an interesting. Well, what about, it obviously it's not logical. That, that's the psychological part. Well, what about the physiological part? The part that like your body is now adapted to not really assimilating carbohydrates the same way that it would assimilate oh, yeah, it when right. you were on a high a high it's fat sort of diet. Feast and famine mentality now, where you're introducing it, and now the body's like wants to store. Well, you remember when, we, when we interviewed what was. The, uh, the ultra marathon runner, like how yeah. he utilized that that exact what I'm oh, talking yeah, about hyper, to his favor. In fact, uh, people who go super super low carb and then introduce carbs later, they actually, if they test them, can look like they're having a crazy sugar response because mm -hmm. their body's so hyper. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, because their body's so hypersensitive to those things. And this can, ha by the way, you can actually, if you eat the same thing over and over again, this can actually set the stage for developing food intolerances or immune reactions to food because if you have any inflammation at all. You could potentially be having these foods do what's called leaky gut syndrome, where it travels through the, the gut lining. And if if every day you eat oatmeal, every single day because it's on your meal plan, oatmeal is getting introduced in that way over and over and over again, you increase your odds of developing, you know, and I've used a random food, but you, you develop a, an intolerance to oatmeal. So eating the same foods all the time, probably not necessarily good for you as well from that particular uh, standpoint. But yeah, the big one is it's, it's just, it's nothing like real life. You know, workouts are different, right? Because although I will say, just if you're just trying to be more active, the more successful approach is to figure out how to make your life more active. We know that. But if you're going to do your resistance training workout, right? I get that. You got to go in, you follow a plan. It's the most effective thing. But here's the difference. If you're the average person trying to get in shape, your resistance training workout that's structured is two to three days a week. If you're really hardcore, fine, five days a week, but that's what, five hours? Maybe at the most, you're looking at 14 hours a week of exercise. How many hours a day are we eating food or contemplating to eat food? Right. It's a completely different ballgame. In fact, as a trainer, it was very easy in comparison to get my clients to work out. It's very hard to get them to eat a particular way because that's what they're dealing with all the time. Mm -hmm. The other problem I have with them is how, how grossly inaccurate they can be. Mm -hmm. So you can you can go get, I mean, you could go use like our you know, macro calculator and put in like your activity level and your your age and how long, how much you're exercising, how much your body fat percentage, your goals. You can enter all this this data to get a, a good idea of what a meal plan or where you should be at for your goal. But the problem with that, it goes back to your point about not mimicking real life is that have you guys ever had a client that burns the same amount of calories no. day in and day out for weeks on end? The metabolism doesn't even work that way. No, right? it's it's so different. The di and that, I mean, I remember remember when this came together. I remember this was when Body Bug came out, like in the early two thousands, when I realized like, and th this was for myself, right? So for the longest time, I had this this massive plateau, like I couldn't get leaner than about 9% body fat. And I was a trainer. I understood macros really well. I was training really well. And I was extremely disciplined Monday through Friday. And then on, on Saturday and Sunday, I would, you know, I, I would, I wouldn't eat like an asshole, but I would let myself off the diet. I wouldn't be following a meal plan per se. Right. And, or that might be a day that I might take off of training. I was so clueless to the, d the difference in my calorie expenditure. Now, looking back, it, and, and probably listeners are going like, duh, you know, when, when I tell the story here, because I'm a trainer working 10 hours plus a day, okay, which means I'm walking around, picking mm -hmm. weights up, training clients 10 hours in a day, and also training on that day. So I'm burning 5,000 plus calories. 
Then I could be the guy on Saturdays, like, man, I worked hard all week. I'm sleeping in till ten or eleven. Keeping my feet up. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Wa- games on. Yeah, I'm gonna watch football for all the way till six o'clock. You know, and then my first bit of activity is to go to the refrigerator or whatever. And then all of a sudden, I look and I, I see that I'm burning twenty five hundred calories. Now I had a, a tool eventually to like clue me in on this, but it was enough. I was doing enough damage on Saturday or Sunday or both to counteract all the great work that I was doing during the week. And so you you have to, in order to figure this out, you've got to learn your own patterns and behaviors like that so you can adjust the way you're eating well, accordingly. And, it, it, and to take it even a step further, right? Your mm-hmm. food, just like your workouts, by the way, if you really want them to su- succeed for you long term, they should be used like tools and they should be uh, manipulated, modified to improve your quality you of life. You got to individualize it. Yeah, so it makes no sense that I'd have the same food or meal plan week in and week out, whether I'm stressed, whether my sleep is good or not, whether or not my workouts are more intense because I feel better or not, whether my activity is changing or not, if I have any potential nutrient deficiencies or illness, am I sick, should I eat the same? This doesn't make any sense. And it's also teaching, really, meal plans, I hate this that they do this, but they teach you to not listen to your body. Right. They teach you to follow directions, which is terrible. We're so disconnected from our bodies right. what anyway. What if you have digestive issues? Like, and you're still like, if your meal plan says this, I have to keep cramming this in my face uh, because my coach will get mad. But, you know, meanwhile, like your stomach is giving you a lot of information that, you know, this is something that we need to slow down. We need yeah. to, you know, adjust our, our diet and, and pick a different... Uh, uh, food. I've actually had people, I'll tell people that and they'll say, yeah, but then I'll just change my meal plan. It's like, okay, yeah. what's the point? Like, what do you mean changing meal plan every day? That's called eating normally and figuring out how to listen to your body. Again, we're so disconnected anyway from our body. And now what we're telling people is, Hey, don't worry about any other signals your body's telling besides hunger, which you know what that's, that's like, just don't listen to anything else. Follow this meal plan. doesn't matter how you feel, what's going on. This is what you're eating because we're looking for this particular result. Not only are you not, only are you not going to get long-term success, but if you do this as your approach, you're probably taking steps back. Now, you may be listening thinking, but if I lose 20 pounds, am I taking two steps back? Because you're going backwards away from the root, the, the real way to solve this problem. So then, yeah, you lose 20 pounds, you gain it back, you gain some, and then, and then some, and now you're in a position where... You just you've wasted so much time not listening to your body. In fact, you've learned how to ignore it even more. Well, you also you miss out on the the best part is actually the journey. You may not think so, and you and and but you realize that once you finally get to the destination, when you've gone through the journey, right? It's kind of like your analogy, your Mount Everest mm-hmm. analogy, you always talk about, or how we talk about the lottery winners and why they end up broke all the time is because you didn't build the behaviors to get there. Right. Mm-hmm. And and that's the part of the process when you're when you're learning about your body, how your body responds to foods, what foods you like, what foods you don't like, what mirrors your lifestyle. That's all part of the journey and it's and even if it may take you a little longer to get to the goal, it's necessary it's for you valuable. for the yeah, for the whole fulfillment part. Right. Otherwise, you do just get in shape and then it's like, uh, I don't know what to do from here, you end up falling out of shape. It's a total different experience. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and really meal plans encourage this this thought as well, which is this is the plan I'm going to follow until I get to this goal. And what does that mean? Then I get off, right? Yeah. So, yeah. unless you stay on that meal plan forever, which even then I can argue is not going to work for you long term because the points we said earlier were your body changing and stuff. But let's just pretend everything stays the same it, and you, you followed it exactly the same for the rest of your life. Sure, you'd lose your weight and you'd keep it off. But nobody really thinks of it that way, right? Do you want to follow this meal plan forever? No, no, no. Just until I get to my goal. And then what do you do afterwards? Well, here's what ends up ha- when you do, when you when you do when you go off of it. The way that it looks is in the opposite direction. There's a reason why the term binge exists. It's not having one cookie. It's having a whole sleeve of cookies. It's not just going off the meal plan to something similar. It's I'm off now. Now let's go and go crazy. And this is the behavior that it trains. It's actually training this specific behavior. There's also the danger of this, and we didn't even list this when we were first talking about this episode, is that of slowing your metabolism down. I've seen this a a bunch of times with trainers that work for me where they assess a client, they put them on a meal plan, they they see that it's still not working. And so all they do is they go to the 
Just keep, keep going. shaving the calories. Yeah, they down. keep shaving the calories down, calories down before long. They've got, you know, one of our clients on a 800 calorie diet and they're telling them they got to stick to this. And then they the clients doing as they're told because that's what they pay them for. And they follow that diet for months on end at 800 calories, literally just completely destroying this person's metabolism and setting them up for absolute t- tremendous failure later. Yeah. In fact, in, in my experience, uh, people do better when their calories fluctuate a little bit throughout the week and even on a, on a weekly basis. So, and they actually have done studies on this. They've shown where They'll compare two types of people, two groups of people. Mm -hmm. This group over here is a calorie deficit the whole eight weeks or whatever. This group over here does a calorie deficit for three weeks and then throws in two or three days of maintenance or above and then goes back down to the cut. And when they compare the two, the people that fluctuate their calories, uh, of course, trending downward still, result in more fat loss and more muscle maintained. The other group tends to not lose as much body fat and actually loses a little bit more muscle. Now, real life... In the real world, even if you go back to how we evolved, there's no way in hell you ate the exact same thing every single day. No. It just wasn't. I mean, unless you were literally the most successful hunter of all time. <laughs> yeah. You and, and and you were also very disciplined. It was very different. Yeah, some this is new world problems. Yeah. Some some days are very high calorie. Some days were very low calorie. So our bodies evolved, probably doing best with. And we've talked about this on other episodes. This mini cut and mini bulk, and our behaviors work around this as well. A meal plan is so unnatural. It's so anti-human nature, and it so teaches us to ignore our bodies that you actually develop behaviors without realizing it, just unintentionally. Do you develop behaviors that make fat loss or make fitness harder for you in the future? Because you ignore your body. I'm not listening to my body right now. I'm just following this damn meal plan. You are extremely restricted which leads to a rebound in the opposite direction. So you combine those three things, and what you have is a perfect storm for a worse problem in the future. And I've seen that. I've seen that with my own eyes. So now that we've shit all over meal plans, let's <laughs> let's give the audience an idea of what it looks like. So if you guys are coaching somebody right now, uh, and we're talking about nutrition, we don't need to worry about exercise. That's all we're going to talk about is meal plan type stuff right now. How do you get your clients to uh, have better behaviors around food? And what does that maybe, let's just say, the first couple weeks to a month process start to look like? Now, Mm -hmm. of course, this is very specific from person to person, right? But we're talking to a big audience, so we're going to be a little bit more general. So if I have, and this has to be appropriate for the person, but if I have a person in front of me and they they want to lose weight, they're you know, motivated, but they have some good discipline as well. So I, I, I see this already. And I say, okay, there's, I can definitely restrict with this person. By the way, this is not super common. But if I could, I would just work by restricting the foods that encourage the behaviors mm-hmm. that get them to overeat. So these could be trigger foods. These could be foods that they eat at certain periods of time when they're in front of the TV. Or it can become a category of foods like heavily processed foods, which tend to make Definitely, people overeat. Yeah, I think the first step uh, out of all steps is really the awareness piece where it's it's really about like – cataloging. And I know like Adam voices this a lot in terms of like, uh, you know, writing everything down and, and having a log and, um, you know, it's a bit of a, a, a pain in the ass and it's work for the clients, but th- you have to bring it to light. It, a lot of times people are just unaware. They're unaware that they're consuming a bag of chips in their cars or driving. Uh, they're unaware that they're drinking certain drinks that actually have calories in them. You know, we have to bring it back to a very, very basic level to, 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 to start educating yeah. that, you you are introducing a lot more calories than you even realize. 100%. This is step one for me. And it is exactly that. It's just bringing awareness to these people and with no restriction. And so you got to you got to make sure you're clear with that if you're a coach and you're helping your clients. Like, listen, I when I tell them, okay, I want you to track food for the next week. I like a week to two weeks, right? At least a week. With a week, I can still do a lot. Two weeks is even better. It's just more information for me, right? More data I can look at. And it's long enough that they don't try to fake it. Well, and, that, and I make that clear. I say, listen... I want you just to log your food. Now, when I say I want you to log your food, this isn't like good version of you. This is whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, eat like you Nor- normally eat, do. Yeah, eat like this was a two weeks ago before you hired me. Eat what you want to eat, when you want to eat it. All I want to do is track it. And I tell them, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for patterns in your behavior. That's it. Mm-hmm. So I'm not judging you. I'm not saying you can or can't do anything. This is going to give me insight on where I'm going to take us from there. So you tell them, go for it. Go to town on what you would normally do. And from there, you can pick up on the things that Sal was kind of alluding to before. Of like, yes. what are some of their your, their big offenders? Oh, wow. Yep. She drinks 
three Cokes every single day or, oh, wow, she hasn't had a single vegetable yeah. in five days or he doesn't get enough yeah. protein. Or to even even go deeper, like, wow, I noticed when you have your glass of wine, you tend to really overeat. That mm. looks like it's a trigger for you. So let's see if we can separate the two. You can have your wine, but don't eat any food. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those types of behaviors. Um, or, and this is more common, by the way, more often than not, the first place you start is by adding. By adding something. Now, right. the reason why you add something is this actually encourages better behaviors. To give you an example, studies show relatively consistently that when people start exercising, they also start to watch what they eat and they start to naturally eat healthier. Well, it also just it automatically pushes something else out, mm -hmm. right? Like if you add, if somebody you looked at and they, they yeah, don't- like make sure you eat this many grams of protein. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Just by telling protein them- Protein and fiber. It's such a, it's a, it's was one of my favorite hacks when I pieced this together because- it's so when you do when you play the whole you can't thing with people it's just a, it's a terrible rabbit hole to go down mm -hmm. so start, and reversing that on somebody who needs to lose like 40 or 50 pounds or they come lose 40 50 pounds they already think like oh he's going to tell me i can't do this can't do that what a way to flip it on ahead as a coach and be like listen i'm not going to tell you you can't have anything but i do notice that when you do your week looks like this so i want you to do this right and that could be adding a chicken breast or two every single day. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful is they don't even realize what you're doing is, but you're adding something to their diet, which will naturally push something else yeah. out in. Now you don't just leave it that right. Right. When it happens and they see the weight loss, you tell them mm -hmm. this is what happened. Right. Are you, wow. Why did I lose weight when I didn't eat heavily processed foods? I was full all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason why that happened is those foods actually encourage you to overeat or why did I lose weight when I added protein to my diet. Well, yeah. because protein is very satiating. You also were aiming for good foods, which crowded out the bad foods oftentimes. Here's one. This was a funny one for me. And I remember when I first saw this, I thought there was something magical about, about what I told people to do. But the reality was it just encouraged better behaviors. I would tell people, all right, here's what we're going to start with. I tracked your stuff. You brought me your, 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 you've tracked yourself for the past couple of weeks. Let's start with this for now. Just drink a gallon of water yeah, every day. I was going to say drink more water. Yeah, just drink a gallon a of water. And, and people would lose weight. And the funny thing is people come like, I didn't know water sped up your metabolism. <laughs> yeah. this I have all this so, energy. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I would, I would educate. I would say, okay, no, actually, here's what happened. I mean, in, uh, that happens a little bit. It's definitely good for you. But here's what actually happened. Did you notice what you weren't drinking as much when you started drinking mm -hmm. a gallon of water? Or did you notice your calories naturally dropped? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we eat when we're thirsty. and Or the fact that drinking water makes you not It feel also so gives them something to focus on. And a lot of times people eat just because they're bored. Yeah. <laughs> because they're mindlessly eating and they're bored. Where if you'd give them like a goal that they're like watching this gallon where they're like marking it off. Like I have clients mark it off at what time it was at so they know where they need to be. And they're like, they're, just, they're focused on that. Yep. And they're thinking about that. And and they're probably peeing like five times more than what they're used to. Yep. Those two things alone already gives them gives them something to do so they're not munching on stuff. Yes. Now, the other thing I like to do is I like to help people develop behaviors around, especially foods. You, you, you can call them trigger foods or these are challenge foods for people. Everybody knows what they are for themselves. For me, it's salty starches, so like potato chips or French fries. Like those for me are just so, so triggering. Delicious. Right? I, I go crazy with them. And so what I'll, what I'll do with them is we'll identify some of these things and I'll say, okay, here's what we're going to do. You can have them. Let's just create a barrier between you and that food. So what does that mean? Okay, so potato chips, that's a challenge for you. Don't have them in the house. Now, if you want them, you can drive to the store and grab yourself a single serving of potato chips. And you can do that every single day. Mm -hmm. I, it doesn't matter to me. It's all good. But don't have it in the house. Now, I, I, I didn't have to say anything else, but I knew when I would create this barrier this gave them the opportunity to become a little bit more aware. Yeah. You do this four, you drive to the grocery store four or five times. You start to think to yourself, like, do I really want these? Why do I want yeah. these? I have something else in that. Or you know I what? try to wrap lunch. in these snacks with your actual meals. So you don't actually eat in between the meals. You're eating the meal. And so, you know, and, and, and two, the, I remember you talked about us a long time with kids. It's like, you know, presenting certain foods in the beginning. So it's like, if you have your protein ahead of time, you have your fibers and then, yeah, now we're, we have some chips, but yep. you know, look at, look at how much more, uh, how much less I should say that you're going to eat as a result. I also like to go back and address like awareness thing too. 
and not allowing you to be distracted. So another easy rule, again, not putting restrictions on them, not saying you can or can't have these foods, but all I'm asking you to do is anytime you eat, you cannot be in front of a computer or on a phone mm -hmm. and just, you'd be or amazed. TV. You, yeah. In any sort of like any sort of tool like that, you need to be at your, at a, at a dinner table, right. Or sitting at your counter eating with no distractions. Yeah. Not even a magazine or book. I, used, right. I would have people, I said, no, no, no nothing. Yeah. yeah it's just just food. focusing on your food. This is your time to eat. It's yes. amazing how much, if you're just focused on that, how much you don't overeat just by simply not being distracted right. by the things. And now, and again, what are we talking about? We're talking about things that modify your behaviors naturally, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm eating and I can, know I can eat whatever I want, you know, Adam's my trainer. He said I could eat whatever I want. All I got to do is not have anything else in front of me while I'm eating. Here's what naturally happens. You naturally eat less or you naturally start to become more connected to your body. This makes me feel this way. Or, I, uh, you know, maybe I am full. I don't want to eat as much. And you end up finding you eat less as a result of So this. the next step after you're doing that with behaviors is to now start to uh, connect the dots, mm -hmm. right? So on how these foods make you feel. So now it's starting to change the relationship that you have with different foods, right? So... I hated vegetables. They were tasteless for me. It didn't have a, did not have a good relationship with them for most of my life. And then I started to really pay attention to how I felt when I introduced these foods into my diet. Right. And a lot of clients just are unaware of this. They, they eat it. They don't realize, or they eat bad food and they don't, they don't connect the dots that the reason why they were shitting themselves on the toilet all night long had anything <laughs> yeah. to do with their dinner or their choices they made in the last 24 hours. So the next step for a coach is to start to give them ways or ways to help them make the connection that this is making yeah. you feel build better. new power with uh, you know associations and that's that's the thing with the whole popcorn at the movie theater the whole you know you got to build these new associations with foods that are good for you and what they're actually promoting they actually make it actually and by the way marketers do this already uh, if you do this well enough you'll start to want these foods that's naturally right. your your natural behaviors will be to oh want I cra foods. I crave vegetables now mm -hmm. it, from a, a person a, a decade ago that would say I hate them and rarely eat them to now somebody where there's times where I tell Katrina, like, let's just do our, our Brussels sprout recipe tonight. Mm -hmm. Like I want that for a whole dinner sometimes. That's how much I crave them because I've made that connection of how good my gut, how right. good my gut and feels. At first it was a, it was a very like, I'm here aware connection. Oh, it makes me feel good. But then now it's an unaware I want one. Yes. I want to have a bowl of broccoli or whatever because it makes well, me feel good. Yeah. Or what I notice now is like, if, like, so part of what made me say this, this is all actually just from this last weekend. Last weekend, we had uh, Katrina's mom's birthday. I had a big old slice of cake and enjoyed myself and paid for it for the next day. And I said, and I knew it, knowing and going into it, going like, oh, I haven't had cake in a while. I'm going to enjoy this, whatever. And then the next day, just, oh, just did not feel myself. That that feeling now makes me crave the foods that I know give me the opposite yes. result. Yes. And it wasn't like I didn't actively think about it. I wasn't like, oh, that made me feel bad. It was all subconsciously. It was like, that was the reason I wasn't feeling very good. I know in my head, like, oh, when I eat these foods, my body feels this oh. way. And you naturally just gravitate it. It does. I remember it. when I was a kid, I hated uh, the taste of cooked spinach. I mean, spinach is, it's, it's bitter. No, no kid likes it. And then I watched Popeye. Now, for people who don't know, Popeye was this cartoon back in the day where he would eat the spinach, he'd get these big muscles, and he'd be super strong, and he'd beat up the bad guy. So then I wanted to eat spinach. I still didn't like the taste, but because I associated it with strength, I started to want it. Until this day, I like spinach. Yeah. But the truth is, it's the association. So what you're doing is you're connecting the dots, both negative and positive. Man, you know, I notice when I eat, you know, uh, cookies – that uh, it affects my skin. I start to break out a little bit. I've actually seen this with, with certain foods. Chocolate, in fact, uh, for some people will cause them to break out. I know dermatologists say that that doesn't happen, but I think it's full of shit. I've seen it with my own eyes, right? And so they yeah, connected. My, my dermatologist never said that sugar was affecting my psoriasis for years either. So Yeah, and you <laughs> see it. Yeah. 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 So people will eat this thing, notice that, oh, my digestion's off, my sleep is off, I feel irritable afterwards, my energy crashes. And you're just being aware. You're connecting the dots. What you'll find is over time, you'll stop craving those foods as much. Same thing with the positive associations. I notice when I eat beef, I feel energized. You know, Maybe you're, you're lacking some nutrients or whatever. Maybe you're lacking iron. So you eat beef and you feel energized. Maybe when you eat vegetables, your digestion improves. And you notice this. And over time, you start to want those foods. This is how you start to mold and shape your behavior in a way that allows you to find success long term. Because up until now, 
our behaviors have been directed around, uh, you know, hyper palatability. Right. Whatever How, tastes the best. Whatever tastes the best. Oh, this makes this tastes the best, the most enjoyable to eat. Completely ignoring. That's why I, I said earlier in the podcast about being disconnected from our bodies. Do you know how many people don't even realize that they're bloated, that they're sluggish, that they whatever? Mm -hmm. This is just how they feel. I know people, I used to have clients that would take, uh, you know, antacids just every single day. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just I have, I have heartburn. Mm -hmm. Like, did you know that, that you're not supposed to have that? Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe what you're eating is, is causing that kind of stuff. So meal plans are the most restrictive diet. They train the wrong behaviors. And in our experience, people not only fall off the wagon and gain the weight back, but they actually gained weight on top of it, making it much worse. Look, if you like our content, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We've got a lot of great free information there, things that can help you burn body fat, build muscle, and become more fit. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Imagine if the goal was to be the best soccer player on the field or the best baseball player on the field or the best basketball player on the court. You would not go and practice your techniques with full intensity all the time. That wouldn't make you the best. You would practice the technique. And then occasionally you'd go hard. You play a game.